We continue with our keynote address uh, by Mr. John Allen. Uh, in many ways, I don't think John Allen needs a whole lot of um, introduction. If you've been uh, uh, following Pope Francis for the last year, you follow the conclave and the resignation, it was John Allen in Rome uh, it, through his reporting, through his blogs, that uh, at least I, I, maybe I speak for many, we kind of kept up with what was going on uh, uh, in the, these uh, very interesting times. So um, again, please welcome John Allen, who will give us our keynote address. It's called Pillars of Francis's Revolution. Thank you, John. Uh, well, thank you for having me today, among other reasons, because if I were not with you this afternoon, if I were not getting paid to be here, I would have had to be in Rome covering the Pope Obama summit. So you shaved about eight hours off my travel time, so thank you for that. <laughs> Now listen, when the, when the conversation turns to Pope Francis and the tsunami uh, in Catholic life we have lived through over the last 12 months, the temptation is to do nothing other than tell you Francis' stories because, you know, they're, they're legion by now and they are all terrific. But I owe you something a little bit more reflective than that. So let me give you a sense of my game plan this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of vignettes uh, about the Francis effect. That is, a couple different ways of measuring the magnitude of the sense in which this new pope has sort of taken the world by storm. So we'll start with that. Then I'll spend most of my time outlining what I see as three emerging pillars uh, of the Francis Revolution. That is, three areas in which this pope's interest seems to be the most acute and therefore where his impact is likely to be the greatest. Uh, then I'll say a couple of words about reaction to Pope Francis and, and what we do with it. Uh, and I'll end with a final thought and then we'll sort of turn the conversation over everyone else and see where you want to take it. All right? So let's start with two different ways of taking the temperature of the Francis effect. Let's say a brief word about his popular appeal and then secondly about his media appeal. Okay? Beginning with his popular appeal. Lots of different ways we could measure this. We can start with the fact that Pope Francis recently broke the 12 million mark on Twitter. Do you all know that? <laughs> uh, he is now the most followed spiritual leader on Twitter, uh, although not yet the most followed human being on Twitter. Do you all know who the most, most followed person on Twitter is? Kardashian. Huh? Kardashian. Kardashian, no. Good guess, but no. Usually I get Justin Bieber, uh, but Justin Bieber is actually in second place. The most followed human being on Twitter is actually Lady Gaga. Oh. And surely, ladies and gentlemen, the apocalypse cannot be far behind. <laughs> but listen, give the Pope a break. He's only been on, on Twitter 12 months, okay? I mean, to have a 12 million following is not so bad. Or, or we could talk about the Pope's poll numbers. It is a fact, okay? Not a hunch. Not a theory, not an anecdotal impression. It is a hardcore, take it to the bank, empirical fact that this pope has approval ratings in every corner of the world in which, in which public opinion can be scientifically measured. He has approval ratings that politicians and celebrities would sacrifice their children to pagan gods to obtain. Okay? And it is therefore no secret why all the titans of the earth, including today, President Obama, are beating a path to the Pope's door. Start, well, I mean, here is one measure of that. The, ne the network that I work for, CNN, recently did a survey that found that President Obama, or, sorry, President Obama, that Pope Francis has almost a 90%, that's 9 zero, almost a 90% approval rating among American Catholics. Now, sit with that number for a moment and reflect upon what you know about how badly divided the Catholic Church in the United States is on virtually everything. Okay, the truth of it is, under ordinary circumstances, it would be tough to get 90% of American Catholics to agree that today is Thursday. Okay? Uh, and in that context, the fact that the new pope has that kind of approval rating is nothing short of staggering, and frankly, if we ever get around to beatifying and canonizing Jorge Mario Bergoglio, I would suggest that this could count as his first miracle. Okay? <laughs> it is remarkable. But none of that uh, is the vignette I want to offer you. Uh, instead, the illustration of the Pope's popular appeal I want to, to, to give to you 
comes from his trip in July to Brazil for World Youth Day. Uh, you probably know that that trip was originally planned for Benedict the 16th, but then, of course, uh, Francis took over. Uh, and so from the uh, 21st to the 28th of July, uh, he was in Brazil. That trip reached its crescendo uh, at the end uh, on Saturday evening for the youth vigil and Sunday morning for the culminating mass, where on two different occasions, twice, Pope Francis drew crowds in excess of three million people to Rio's Copacabana Beach, the world's most famous stretch of sand and surf. Uh, and by the way, that turnout shattered the previous attendance record at Copacabana Beach, which was held by, wait for it, the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and let me tell you people something, when you can go on American television and craft sentences that have both the Pope and Mick Jagger in them, you were really on to something. <laughs> okay? But that's not even the story I want to tell. The story I want to tell comes from Thursday during World Youth, Week, uh, World Youth Day week when Pope Francis went downtown in Rio to the cathedral to visit a group, uh, well, the ostensible purpose was to visit a group of Argentinian youth uh, who were in town for this event. Uh, but of course, when word got out that the Pope was coming, everybody else showed up. Uh, and so it was kind of a mob scene in downtown Rio. Now, I was in the press bus for this event, so we were right behind the Pope mobile. When we got to the cathedral, we pulled around to the back in this area that was supposed to be a secure zone, right? It was sort of cordoned off. That was the idea. Uh, but uh, there was this group of Latin American nuns that had somehow wormed their way uh, into this space. So when the door of the Pope Mobile opened and Francis pops out, this group of nuns rushed him shrieking like teenage girls at a Justin Bieber concert. <laughs> okay, it was complete chaos. <laughs> Now, the Brazilians had deployed like 20,000 troops and cops and so on to try to prevent this sort of thing from happening. So I pulled one of these guys aside and I said to him, what is going on? Why didn't you get in the way? Why didn't you do anything? And he looks at me and he says, look at me, man. I've got a combat helmet on my head. I've got ammo strapped across my chest. I am not going to be the guy caught on YouTube beating up a nun. <laughs> It's just not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was the spirit of those days. There, there is an electricity and a ferment around this man that is so irrepressible that any attempt to kind of fence it in or bottle it up is just destined to fail. Okay? There is something about this pope that has lit a fire uh, in the popular imagination that just cannot be denied. Okay? So that's his popular appeal. Let's say a word about his media appeal. Folks, I don't think there is any question that Pope Francis has become the new media celebrity, the new media icon par excellence uh, of the early 21st century. In many ways, actually, I think you could make a good argument that from a media point of view, Pope Francis today occupies that niche uh, in the media universe that was heretofore occupied by Nelson Mandela. That is, the kind of unquestioned moral authority, towering point of moral reference on the global stage. Okay. Now, there are many, again, there are many different ways we could illustrate this. I mean, we could talk about uh, all the, the I mean, for example, there was a media foundation in late December that did a survey that found that Francis was the most searched human being on Google in calendar 2013. The most searched human being. And bear in mind, he was not elected pope until mid-March, which means every other human being on the planet had a two and a half month head start on the pope, uh, and yet he finished at the top of the list. Uh, or uh, we could talk about all the magazine covers uh, that he made. Uh, he was, of course, Time's Person of the Year. And while he wasn't the first pope to get that honor, the first was John XXIII and the second was John Paul II, he certainly was the fastest. John XXIII had been pope for almost five years by the time he got the honor. John Paul II had been in office 14 years before he was declared Time's Person of the Year. Francis had not been in office for even a year before he was given that designation. 
Uh, or uh, we could talk about the fact that he was on the cover of The Advocate. Uh, or we could talk about the fact that he was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I did buy five copies for my mother uh, when that happened. But here's my favorite example of the way in which he's captured the imagination of the media industry. Because Time was not actually the first global magazine to name Francis its person of the year. Do you all know what the first one was? It was the Italian edition of Vanity Fair magazine. Vanity Fair, okay? This is not a diocesan newspaper out there someplace. Okay, this is not exactly an organ that over the years has been particularly friendly to the Catholic Church. Uh, but there it was. Oh, and as a footnote, uh, that write-up included a tribute from that well-known Vatican expert, Elton John, uh, who described Pope Francis as, quote, an island of humility in an era of vanity. Okay, great line. Okay, actually wish I had written it. I'm kind of waiting for people to forget that that came from Elton John and I can recycle it. But here's the remarkable thing. That issue came out in June. Now, Vanity Fair, like every other magazine in the world, typically does its Person of the Year issue in December, right? Logically enough, at the end of the calendar year. But the editors had decided that by June, okay, Francis had already done enough that nothing else they were going to see from any other person for the rest of the year could possibly surpass it. I mean, this is the media equivalent of the 10-run rule in American Little League Baseball, okay? <laughs> You know how we have this rule, that if one team gets more than 10 runs ahead of the other, we decide they're embarrassing the opposition, and so we just call the game? Well, that's basically what Vanity Fair did. They decided that by June, Francis was basically embarrassing the competition, uh, and so they pulled the trigger on the Person of the Year award. Point is, you will never need any other proof of how thorough Francis has ensconced himself uh, as the new kind of media celebrity and media icon par excellence. Okay? I mean, now listen, we could go on cataloging other examples of the way in which this pope has taken the world by storm, but I hope the point is already clear. Uh, that in an utterly improbable sense, something you never could have predicted on March 12, 2013, the new pope of the Catholic Church has become not only the most popular human being on the planet, and again, that's not a theory, that's a measurable empirical fact, uh, but he's also captured the imagination of an industry, in this case the media industry, that typically is not particularly positively disposed to religious figures. Okay? Uh, and while that's fun to, to sort of, you know, focus on the pope's celebrity, from a Catholic point of view, what all this amounts to is a remarkable evangelical and missionary opportunity. Because of this pope and the way in which the eyeballs of the world are now on him, the Catholic Church has an opportunity to reintroduce itself to the world. And therefore, the $64,000 question becomes, what do we do with that opportunity? Okay, and I will come back to that at the end. But for now, let's switch gears for a moment, and let me try to identify for you what I would see as three emerging pillars of Francis's papacy, that is, three of the cornerstones of this pope's thinking, his agenda, his priorities. And let me preface this by saying that, of course, not long ago, uh, we celebrated the one-year anniversary uh, of this pope's election, two weeks ago to the day. Uh, and that occasion uh, brought forth yet another cycle of interpretation and analysis and exegesis of Francis. As you all know, there are lots of different competing theories out there about who Francis is and what he's about and where he's taking the church. And it can be difficult sometimes to cut through the noise, right, to understand what is actually going on. I mean, even the Pope himself has expressed some frustration uh, with the competing sort of narratives uh, about him that are out there. In his recent interview with the Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera, he talked about some of the mythology that has grown up around him. 
uh, in, you know, I mean, for example, this business that he goes out at night incognito in Rome to give sandwiches to the homeless guys who are around St. Peter's Square. And he said, it's never entered my mind to do that. I have no idea where that came from. Uh, and yet, of course, it metastasizes in the internet. So, I mean, the point is, there's a lot of stuff out there. If you understand the following three points about Francis, I think you're going to be able to cut through a great deal of that. Uh, and get your hands around what this pope is really about uh, and where he is really trying to take the Catholic Church. Okay? So let me briefly tick off these three pillars and then I will unpack each one of them in turn. First, leadership as service. Leadership as service. Two, a missionary church. A missionary church. And three, mercy as the most important Christian message of this moment in time. Mercy as the core Christian message of our era. Okay. Let's start with leadership as service. In the early days after Francis' election, it was those gestures of personal humility and simplicity that really sort of took the world by storm, right, and framed the narrative around this pope. So, the fact that uh, when he left the Sistine Chapel after his election, he did not get in the chauffeur-driven Mercedes limousine for the Pope, but hopped on the bus with the other cardinals. Uh, that, you know, when he stepped out onto uh, the balcony overlooking St. Peter's Square, before he imparted his blessing on the crowd, he knelt in silent prayer and waited for the people to pray for him. Uh, the fact that, rather, that, that he went back to the Casa del Clero, the residence for Roman clergy, kind of a hotel in Rome that he stayed in before the conclave to pack his own bag and pay his own bill. Uh, the fact that rather than living in the cavernous papal apartment, he chose to stay in room 201 of the Doma Santa Marta, which is the, room, the, the hotel on Vatican grounds that he had lived in during the conclave. Uh, the fact that uh, after his election, he picked up his cell phone, and by the way, first pope in history to have his own cell phone, uh, he picked it up and he called his newspaper delivery guy in Buenos Aires to say, hey, I'm not going to be coming back, can you please cancel my subscription? Uh, and, and by the way, if I were Mario Poli, the new Archbishop of Buenos Aires, I'd be a little ticked off by that because now I've got to restart the subscription. But, you know, anyway, you get the idea. He even picked up that same phone and called his shoemaker in Buenos Aires to say, hey, I'm not coming back. You know those brown shoes I dropped off? Could you please put them in a box and send them over, right? That kind of stuff, okay? Now, listen, at one level, uh, these gestures arise naturally from the personality and the biography of Jorge Mario Bergoglio. They are simply who the man is. For the 15 years that he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, famously, uh, he never took a, a, a car to get around town. He always hopped on the bus uh, to get to the appointments he was going to. Uh, he did not live in the lavish Archbishop's residence. Instead, he chose to live in a Spartan two-room apartment downtown near the cathedral. And when I say Spartan, folks, I am not trading in euphemisms. I visited this apartment. It's the kind of place where he had to leave the stove on 24-7 during the winters because the building could not afford central heat. Okay. He was very much in Argentina seen as a bishop of the Vichas, the Vichas Miserias, that's the, the villas of misery. That's the Argentinian term for a slum. So much so that when I went down in April to do some reporting on the new pope, I visited one of these vishas and I was interviewing one of his priests. And I said to him, okay, this, this thing about Bergoglio being the bishop of the poor, is this real or is it PR? And this priest told me, well, don't take my word for it. Go out and just ask people in the streets. Ask the people who live here. So I took my interpreter. We went out in the streets of this Visha. It's actually Visha 21 in Buenos Aires because there are so, by the way, these, these slums are so anonymous. They don't even have names. They just have numbers. That's how forgotten these people are. So there in Visha 21 on the streets among the poorest of the poor of Argentinian society, I randomly stopped six or seven people. And I asked them, what can you tell me about the new pope? And you know what they all did? Before they even verbalized an answer, what they did is they ran into the tin shacks or the wooden shacks that they called homes. 
and they came back out with prized pictures showing Bergoglio baptizing their kids or confirming their nephews or sitting in their living room when their husband had died because that's where he spent his time. Okay? So in, 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 from a certain point of view, these gestures we saw from Bergoglio at the beginning were simply biographical and they were personal, but there's more than that. Because here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, if you want one thing you dare never forget about Jorge Mario Bergoglio, here it is. Okay. Beneath that humble, simple exterior, which is not a PR facade, it really is who he is, but beneath that humble, simple exterior lies the mind of an incredibly crafty and savvy Jesuit politician. Okay. <laughs> this guy knows what he's doing all the time. Okay. So these gestures weren't simply spontaneous personal expressions. Okay. They were also intended to recalibrate expectations for leadership in the Catholic Church. Fundamentally, what Pope Francis wants is that when people look at the symbols of authority in the Catholic Church, when they look at a Roman collar or when they look at a pectoral cross, he wants them instinctively to think in terms of service rather than in terms of power and privilege. Okay, service rather than power and privilege. To make the point that this is not just a journalistic hypothesis, Pope Francis has laid all this out in black and white. On the 22nd of June, he gave a speech to all of the papal nuncios throughout the world. The nuncio is the papal ambassador in the various countries who plays a lead role in the selection of new bishops. And he presented to them his vision of the kind of bishop he wants them to look for. And he said that what we do not want, and this is his language, what we do not want is a bishop who has, quote, the psychology of a prince. Okay, so that's, that's what you're not looking for. Uh, instead, he said, what we want is a, is a bishop, is a pastor, and again, his language, who carries the smell of his sheep because he is close to the ordinary people he is called to serve. Okay, so that's the Pope's vision. Further, we also know that this is not mere rhetoric, that Pope Francis is willing to take action to back this up, and the proof of the point uh, is his intervention in the Diocese of Limburg in Germany. Have you all heard the story of the famous Bling Bishop in Limburg? This is Bishop Franz Peter Tabarts von Elst. I mean, the name itself just reeks of privilege, doesn't it? Franz Peter Tabarts von Elst. It's kind of unfortunate, because the guy actually comes from a family of poor farmers, but the name certainly did not help him uh, as this narrative unfolded. This is the bishop in Germany who got in hot water in the fall when it emerged that he had spent more than $40 million uh, remodeling his residence, uh, including the staggering sum of more than a million dollars for landscaping. And, and here's the thing I have the hardest time understanding, $25,000 for a bathtub. Now, I honest to God do not know what kind of bathtub you can buy for $25,000. I mean, when this story broke, I hit a couple of Home Depots and I could not find anything. Okay. But apparently it's out there uh, and His Excellency found it. Now, when, when this story emerged, Pope Francis first sent an investigator to the Diocese of Limburg in September, a very uh, senior Vatican official by the name of Cardinal Giovanni Laiolu, who used to be the Vatican's foreign minister. Uh, and then in October, uh, he called uh, the bishop and the president of the German Bishops' Conference, Archbishop Zolich, uh, to Rome and basically engineered a soft landing uh, for the bishop, told him he would have an unspecified period of sabbatical outside the diocese. Uh, the, the denouement of all this happened just yesterday uh, when the Holy Father accepted the definitive resignation of the bishop from the Diocese of Limburg. And in the meantime, the leading theories uh, are that this remodeled residence uh, will become either a center for refu refugees uh, and immigrants or some kind of soup kitchen, but in any event, uh, it will no longer be the place where the bishop lives. Now, in, in the Catholic world, this was kind of the shot heard around the world because it made the point that Pope Francis is not merely rolling out lofty-sounding rhetoric 
about simplicity in leadership, but he's also willing to make it stick through his administrative actions. Okay? Now listen, people, I mean, I've been talking about bishops because in many ways they're our most visible leaders, but I think in Pope Francis's mind, this is a much broader point. I think it applies to anybody who plays a leadership role on behalf of the Catholic Church. Uh, I think the, the point is that he wants people to understand that in the church, leadership is fundamentally about service. Okay? It is not about the kind of measure of grandeur that the secular world has with regard to leadership positions. And as a coda, let me just say, he came back to this uh, in his uh, December speech to the Roman Curia. Uh, around Christmas time every year, popes deliver a major speech to the leaders in the Roman Curia. That's the central administrative bureaucracy in the Vatican. Uh, and it's sort of akin to the Pope's State of the Union speech. Pope Francis devoted his first speech precisely to this point. What he said to the movers and shakers in the Vatican is that we have to be animated by a spirit of service. Because if we're not, then what we become, and again, this is, these are his words, he said what we become is a heavy bureaucratic customs house. And the world already has plenty of those. Okay? So that's this Pope's vision. Pillar one of the Francis Revolution, leadership as service. Two, a missionary church. A missionary church. One of the sound bites that by now we are all familiar with is Pope Francis, from Pope Francis is this repeated call for the church to get out of the sacristy and into the streets. Right? Out of the sacristy and into the streets. In essence, that's a call for the church to be missionary. I guarantee you people that Pope Francis does not fundamentally regard himself as a CEO of Catholicism Incorporated or as a politician or as a media rock star, although he is undeniably all three of those things. Fundamentally, he regards himself as the evangelist in chief of the Catholic Church, the missionary in chief of the Catholic Church. His ambition is to relight the missionary fires of the church. Mission defined in its broadest sense okay, uh, is trying to reach out to all the daughters and sons of the postmodern world and with a particular emphasis on those who are most broken, those who are most hurting, those who are most marginalized, those who are most abandoned, to try to bring to them a taste of the love of God and introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ. And that's his ambition. Now, as Pope Francis sees it, I think this mission has both a personal and a social dimension. The personal dimension is to see the hurting person in front of you, okay, and respond to them. So when you see Pope Francis doing things like stopping his Jeep in St. In Peter's Square and hopping off when he sees a guy who is horribly disfigured by boils, the kind of guy that, to be honest, most of us would walk across the street to avoid, okay, and walking up to this guy to wrap him in a warm, loving embrace and give him a kiss on the top of his head. Or when you see Pope Francis inviting a 16-year-old Italian boy with Down syndrome up onto the Pope Mobile to join him for a tour around the square. Or, when you see Pope Francis inviting three homeless guys to join him for his birthday breakfast. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't just the three homeless guys. It was also their dog who was allowed to come up. Do you, do you know what the dog's name is? Marley, for the reggae icon Bob Marley. And let me give you a guarantee, this is the first time the name Bob Marley has ever been uttered in the precincts of the Vatican. <laughs> Now, when you see Pope Francis doing stuff like that, okay, again, part of it is, is just who he is, but part of it is also to symbolize and make concrete what the nature of mission in the Catholic Church actually is. It's not an abstract concept. Okay? It's about seeing the people in front of you most in need of that taste of the love of God and the healing face of Jesus Christ and then offering it to them. So that's the personal dimension of mission, but there's also a social dimension of mission, which has to do with making the social teaching of the Catholic Church a living force 
uh, in the world of the early 21st century. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to say a quick word about this because I think there has been some misunderstanding about this pope's social agenda. You may know that since his election, Pope Francis has given five media interviews, and they've all been blockbusters. The first uh, was on the papal plane coming back from Rio de Janeiro uh, to Rome uh, on the 28th of July, that hour and 20 minute press conference the Pope did, totally impromptu, totally unscripted, totally spontaneous, no holds barred, nothing off the table. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I was on that plane and I was part of that conversation. Let me tell you this about Alitalia Flight 4001 from Rio to Rome on the 28th of July. In many ways, it was nothing to write home about. The seats were uncomfortable, the food was mediocre, but I will give it this, the in-flight entertainment was spectacular. <laughs> okay. Because when you cover the Vatican, you often lay awake at night dreaming about these moments when the Pope is just gonna walk out and say, what do you got? You know, and you never think you're gonna live to see them happen, but there we were. Uh, and since then, uh, you know, he gave an interview to 16 Jesuit publications around the world, which was picked up here in the States by America Magazine. He gave an interview to a left-wing, non-believing journalist in Italy by the name of Eugenio Scalfari and, and two other Italian newspapers. And in several of those interviews, he has made some version of the following point. He has said, I do not believe it is necessary for me to talk so much about issues such as abortion, gay marriage, and contraception because the church's position on those questions is already well known. Now, in some quarters, I think this was taken as the, the Pope somehow retreating from the church's defense of human life. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you, nothing is further from the truth. I mean, the proof of the point would be, after his, the day after his interview with that left-wing, non-believing Italian journalist rolled out, the very next day, he had a session with medical professionals in Italy, an audience, in which he gave one of the toughest pro-life speeches you will ever hear a pope give, in which he defined the right to life as the primordial human right and the basis for every other human right. Okay. Or, you know, you could look to the speech he gave to diplomats on January 13th. Every year the pope gives a speech to the diplomatic corps accredited to the Holy See. This was Francis's first, in which he defined abortion as the most horrific of crimes. Or, if you need additional proof of the point, you know, look at the statement that came from the Holy See today, uh, after the Holy Father's meeting with President Obama, which emphasized uh, in its second paragraph that the Holy Father had touched upon the questions of A, religious freedom, B, the right to life, and C, the right to conscientious objection. Okay, folks, Take it from me, this is a robustly pro-life point. There, or pope, rather, there will be no retreat, there will be no surrender from the gospel of life on Pope Francis's watch. Now, that said, I think Francis also believes that there are other elements of Catholic social teaching that have not always gotten a commensurate level of attention, and he wants to lift those up. And those other points are what conventionally in Christian tradition we talk about as the social gospel. Okay? That is, concern for the poor, uh, opposition to war, uh, concern for the environment, and so on. That whole cluster of, of social justice concerns. And proof of his commitment to those issues would be that his three gutsiest political interventions over the last year have all touched upon some point of the social gospel. Briefly, those three interventions were. First, his July 8th trip to Lampedusa. His trip to Brazil was not his first trip outside Rome. His first trip outside Rome came 20 days earlier to the southern Mediterranean island of Lampedusa, which is down off the coast of Sicily. It is the major point of arrival for impoverished migrants and refugees from Africa and the Middle East who are trying to get to Europe. Okay, typically what these people do uh, they come from Sub-Saharan Africa or they come from the Middle East. They spend a year, 18 months, two years trying to make their way to Libya or Tunisia. They are typically horribly exploited along the way, uh, often sold into human slavery and so on. When they finally get there, they have to fork over whatever meager cash they have left in their pockets to book passage in one of these rickety, overcrowded, dangerous, illegal boats 
to try to get across the Mediterranean to Lampedusa and from there to try to get to some place in Europe they're trying to, to go to. Over the last two decades alone, some 20,000 people, 20,000 human beings, have lost their lives trying to make that crossing. On the 8th of July, Pope Francis went to Lampedusa to lay a wreath in the sea commemorating those victims, to blast what he called a globalization of indifference to immigrants, and then he also rolled out for the first time what has since become one of the standard rhetorical tropes of his papacy, which is the contrast between what he calls a throwaway culture, okay, a culture in which whole categories of people, including migrants, are considered disposable, versus what he calls a culture of welcome that the world is called to embrace and the church is called to model. Okay. Now, why do I say that was gutsy? Well, if you know anything at all, about the politics of contemporary Italy. Uh, in this regard, it's not unlike the United States. There is no more divisive political question in Italy today than immigration policy. Okay? Uh, and the fact that the new Bishop of Rome and the new Patriarch of Italy would devote what amounted to his political debut to taking a strong stand on the m single most divisive question in Italian life was, in that regard, fairly remarkable. His second high-profile high intervention came on the 25th of July when he was in Brazil. The Pope visited a favela, that's the Brazilian word for a slum, a place called Virginia, which is known as the Gaza Strip uh, of Rio de Janeiro because it's been the site of bloody clashes between the police and the drug gangs and various drug gangs who were vying for control. About a year before the Pope came, the Brazilians had unleashed a foul mix of armored personnel carriers in Virginia. They'd basically bulldozed the place and burned it to the ground, and having done that, they then claimed they had brought peace. Pope Francis stood in that space on the 25th of July, wagging his finger and said, no pacification campaign, no attempt to bring peace, will ever be successful, nor will it ever endure until it reckons with the reality that too many people in the society are excluded, marginalized, and cut off from the new circles of opportunity that are being created. Now again, why was that gutsy? Because popes, when they travel, are notoriously reluctant to do anything that would be seen as embarrassing their hosts. Okay, they don't want to create political problems for the governments who are rolling out a red carpet to welcome them. Yet on that day, Francis obviously felt that there was a point important enough worth making that he was willing to sort of rupture that informal taboo. And let me tell you, it rang a bell with the Brazilian political class. That was the lead item in every national newspaper. It was the first segment on every national television program. In effect, it started a national conversation. And then, of course, the Pope's third gutsy political inter intervention came in early September. Back then, you all may remember that the drums of war were beating in Washington and in London and in Paris. The major Western powers were on the brink of launching military strikes in Syria to try to forcibly bring down the regime of President Bashar al-Assad. Pope Francis launched a full court diplomatic press uh, against that idea. All of the 180 countries that have bilateral relations with the Vatican, their ambassadors were summoned in, and the Vatican's diplomatic brain trust laid out the case uh, against the war. Uh, the Pope used his Wednesday general audience, his Sunday Angelus address, every tool in his toolbox to broadcast anti-war messages. I mean, he even sent out anti-war tweets, right? Which makes him a very 21st century Pope uh, in some ways. Uh, and of course, all this culminated on the 7th of September when Pope Francis called all 1.2 billion Catholics of the world to a day of prayer and fasting on behalf of peace in Syria, including himself presiding over an incredibly evocative five-hour penitential liturgy uh, in St. Peter's Square. Now, make no mistake, it is not that Pope Francis or anyone in the Holy See is in denial about how much of a thug and a bully the Assad regime is. But of course, they tend to see these realities through the eyes of 
the people on the ground in Syria, and in particular the influential and important Christian minority in Syria, and if you talk to those people, what they will tell you is however bad Assad may be, the likely alternative is significantly worse. Okay, as they see it, the choice is not between a police state and a thriving democracy. The choice is between a police state and annihilation. Okay, and in that context, it's no secret which they prefer. Now, why was this a gutsy intervention for Pope Francis? Because the Vatican's, what's in the Vatican's DNA, okay, diplomatically speaking, is to be on the side of the major Western powers. This has been the case for centuries. Okay, that the Vatican initially saw the, you know, the, the, the European monarchies and then later the European, the, the nascent European Union and then later the United States. It saw those Western powers as its most natural dialogue partner on the global stage. Here you have the first pope from the developing world and in his geopolitical debut, he takes a position that frankly, substantively speaking, is, was closer to that of Russia and China than it was to the major Western powers. Historically and culturally speaking, that was a major break from where the Vatican traditionally has been. Summing up, the three gutsiest political interventions of this pope over his first year were a pro-immigrant statement, a statement of solidarity with the poor, and an anti-war statement. That's the social gospel in action, and I suspect it is the kind of thing we are going to continue to see from Pope Francis, not in opposition to our pro-life teachings, but as an organic complement to those pro-life teachings. Final pillar of the Francis Revolution, mercy as the core Christian message of our time. Mercy as the core Christian message. Ladies and gentlemen, by now, by this stage in my career, I have covered three popes. I have covered John Paul II, I have covered Benedict XVI, and I have covered Francis. Now, listen, these are all complex men, and you cannot boil them down to handy-dandy little sound bites. Okay? That said, each one of these popes had a sort of signature phrase okay, that, I, that I think captured, in many ways, the heart of the message that they were trying to present to the world gives you a handle on who they were and what they wanted to accomplish. With John Paul II, I, I think there is no doubt what that signature phrase was. It was, be not afraid. Be not afraid. The Latin version of which is duke in ultum, right? Set off into the deep. Okay, this was the, in, you know, his invitation to the church to, to recapture its missionary self-confidence after a period of introspection and self-doubt and so on. Again, with Benedict XVI, I think there is no reasonable doubt about what the signature phrase was. The signature phrase was reason and faith. Reason and faith. That was the heart of the argument that he was trying to present to the world. That human reason without religious faith becomes skepticism and nihilism. That faith without reason becomes extremism and fundamentalism. That to be healthy, these two things need one another. Now, I know it's early in the game with Pope Francis, but I think we already know what his signature phrase is. It's something he has repeated over and over and over and over. So often it ought to be printed on t-shirts. It's like the epigrammatic motto, okay, of Pope Francis. And that phrase is, the Lord never tires of forgiving. The Lord never tires of forgiving. And sometimes Francis adds, it is we who get tired of asking for forgiveness. And fundamentally, it is a message of mercy. Message of mercy. Mercy, ladies and gentlemen, is quite literally this pope's motto. His motto as pope is the same motto he had as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Uh, it's a complicated Latin line. It comes from the venerable Bede, one of Bede's homilies on the Gospel of Matthew. It's that scene in the Gospels of Jesus and Zacchaeus, the tax collector. You all remember the scene? That Zacchaeus climbs the tree and Jesus sees him and he invites him to come down and join him. And Bede's line was that Jesus chose him through the eyes of mercy. And so this Pope's motto is choosing through the eyes of mercy. Choosing through the eyes of mercy. Mercy uh, was in this Pope's first Sunday homily. 
Francis chose to celebrate his first Sunday Mass not in St. Peter's Basilica, but at, uh, in St. Anne's Church, which is the Paris church for the worker bees in the Vatican, okay, the, the lower level people who sweep the floors and open the mail and all that kind of thing. Uh, St. Anne's Church is located right on the border between the Vatican City State and Italy. So Francis went there the Sunday after his election to say Mass. Afterwards, he came out and, and acted like the country pastor that, frankly, I'm convinced he still is in his heart, right? He stood outside the church and did the thing that parish priests all over the world do, which is, you know, shake hands, kiss babies, slap backs, and, and that kind of stuff. As word got out that Francis was doing this, there was a huge crowd that, that, that formed across the street, okay? And Francis, being a man who very much believes in engaging people when they're in front of him, he saw this crowd across the street, and this will indicate that at that stage in his papacy, he still had some on-the-job training to do. Uh, because seeing this crowd, he just plunged over there and started shaking hands and greeting people, not realizing that he had just created an international incident because he had crossed a global border between the Vatican City State and Italy. I mean, the Italian cops were going nuts, I can assure you. And as a broader point, the truth of it is, uh, I have said on CNN's air that in those early days after his election, the whole world may have been charmed by Francis, but I can guarantee you there was one constituency which was not which was his own security detail. Because I can tell you for sure, sales of heart pills were skyrocketing in the Vatican pharmacy. Okay. Anyway, on that day, he goes to St. Anne's Church, and in his homily, he says, in my opinion, the strongest message of the Lord is mercy. Strongest message of the Lord is mercy. This commitment to mercy is also in the Pope's actions. As you know, the Pope is also Bishop of Rome. And one of the things popes try to do in that capacity is they try to get around to see Roman parishes. Okay? Pope Francis so far has visited five Roman parishes. Uh, his first parish visit came on the 26th of May when he went out to the parish of Saints Elizabeth and Zechariah, which is out in a working class neighborhood of Rome called Aor. Pope was supposed to get there at 10.30 in the morning. A papal helicopter, helicopter lands at 9.45. Now, you can imagine the panic the pastor is feeling now, right? So he spills his coffee all over himself, and then he runs out to the parking lot where the, where the papal chopper has landed. Francis pops out, and he says, hey, sorry for the early start, but uh, in addition to saying mass and chatting with the folks, I would also like to hear some confessions. Now, understand, this was not part of the program, okay? So this pastor went and grabbed eight people basically at random, <laughs> okay, and said to them, you're going to confession. Okay. Now, this pastor is a Romanian immigrant by the name of Bioni Ambris, and he told me the story afterwards, it's kind of cute, because he said these people looked at him and they said, well, that's very sweet, Father, but we're actually here to see the Pope, to which his response was, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Come with me. Uh, and he led them inside the church and lined them up at the confessional. One by one, Pope Francis sat there, listened to their sins, and then administered God's forgiveness. Now, in part, this was the pope just trying to be a good bishop of Rome, but in part, it was critically important to him that the world see the pope making a point of celebrating the church's premier right of mercy. Premier right of mercy. I actually believe that everything Francis is doing, from the nitty-gritty details of how do you reform the Vatican Bank, you know, on up to what should our policy on divorced and remarried Catholics be, or how do we engage the crisis in Ukraine, all of it, all of it. Okay. At the end of the day, I think it's premised on the desire that when the outside world looks at the Catholic Church, what they will see is a community of mercy community that is genuinely committed to mercy, okay? not just in lip service, but in the operational reality of our day-to-day -day lives. Now, make no mistake, okay, Francis is no naive. He understands that as a minister of the Christian gospel, he is obligated to do two things. He has to pronounce God's judgment on a fallen world, and he also has to pronounce God's mercy. But I think his calculation is that the world has heard our judgment with crystal clarity. And now it is time for them to hear and to see 
and to smell and to taste and to feel our mercy. I will put it to you this way. In my business, the media business, we have come up with all kinds of cute little sort of monikers for the new pope. You know, we, we call him the people's pope or the pope of the poor, the maverick pope. And all of these things capture something. But if you want my prediction, okay, as of today, okay, March 27th, two, 2014, I predict here and now that when the final word on this papacy is written, Francis will be remembered as the pope of mercy. Pope of mercy. And again, this is not just a journalistic hypothesis. On that flight back from Rio uh, in July, one of the questions Pope Francis was asked was uh, about divorced and remarried Catholics, and he gave an answer. But at the end of it, he said, I would like to make a bigger point. And the bigger point is this. I believe that we are living in a kairos of mercy, a kairos that evocative Greek New Testament term that means a kind of privileged moment in God's plan for salvation. This pope understands this moment in time. He understands his papacy as a kairos for God's mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be the first to introduce to you Pope Francis, the Pope of Mercy. All right, finally, uh, a word about reactions to Pope Francis. Despite what I said at the top uh, about the phenomenal poll numbers and, and the celebrity that Francis enjoys, of course, the truth of it is that no figure who plays on the world stage ever plays to entirely unmixed reviews. Okay? Uh, and I'm sure it's no secret to anyone in this room uh, that there are some out there who are not entirely enchanted with the new pope. Now, you know, in, in the media business, uh, we want to see this, this blowback against, because we want to see everything in terms of left and right, so we want to see this in terms of left and right, too. Uh, so typically, the way we construe it is, uh, it's the right, the Catholic right, that is feeling heartburn, and the Catholic left that is doing somersaults. Okay, that's usually the way the media looks at it. Now, I'm not 100% sure that's true today, and I'm certainly not convinced that that's going to be true as this stuff plays out. I mean, first of all, I know many self-identified conservative Catholics who are feeling awfully good that the, the Pope is the most popular person on the planet. Uh, and I, I think it's also true that because this Pope has quite clearly said that there is going to be no doctrinal change on hot button issues such as women priests and gay marriage and abortion and contraception, there are going to be some on the Catholic left who simply are not going to be satisfied with that. Okay, so as this plays out, I'm not sure the left-right thing really captures uh, where the resistance is likely to be. So I instead, uh, I like to use gospel language. Uh, I, I recently uh, wrote a column in which I asserted <clears throat> that Pope Francis has an older son problem. Okay, and I'm using imagery, of course, from the parable of the prodigal son. I think we could probably all agree that during the first year of his papacy, Pope Francis has done a magnificent job of reaching out to the prodigal daughters and sons of the postmodern world, okay, both inside and outside the church. But my perception would be there are some older sons uh, in the church who feel like they've carried water for the church a long time, who are feeling a little left out of the party. I think we could probably identify at least five such older sons. Okay, first, uh, you know, there would be pro-life Catholics who, despite what I said earlier, nevertheless would be concerned that this pope's determination to dial down the rhetoric on the, cal on the culture wars amounts to a kind of unilateral disarmament. Second, I think there would be some liturgical traditionalists who do not see in this pope the same sense of reverence and even awe for the worship life of the church that they associate with Benedict XVI. Third, uh, I think there would be some doctrinal purists who just wish this pope would be a little bit more careful before he opens his mouth, right? When they see headlines like, God is not a Catholic, you can just hear in theology departments all across this land, what the hell does that mean, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, fourth, uh, I think there would be some political conservatives who would be concerned that this pope's emphasis on the social gospel could shade off into a kind of uncritical embrace of the agenda of the secular left. Fourth, or fifth, and finally, I think there are, there's some church personnel 
uh, including, uh, in particular, people who work in the Vatican, who frankly are just a little tired of listening to this pope take pot shots at them. You know, I mean, describing them as careerists or talking about how they're infected with the leprosy of a royal court uh, and stuff like that. Now, listen, I mean, you know, back to Jorge Mario Bergoglio being an incredibly crafty politician. Believe me when I tell you, he is well aware that this reaction is out there, uh, and he is going to do what he can over the course of time to bring those people along. Okay? Proof of the point uh, would be his recent outreach to an Italian traditionalist by the name of Mario Palombo. Let me start by saying this. Uh, the Pope picked up the phone the other day to call this guy. Now, you know, Pope Francis now profiles in Italy as the cold call Pope because he is infamous for picking up the phone and calling people he's never met. To be honest with you, I'm a little ticked off because I'm the last guy I know who has not gotten a phone call from the Pope. <laughs> I mean, this has become so common that the Italian version of, uh, of, um, What's the guy's name who does the, the, you know, the, the fake news show at night? Is that Jonathan Stewart? John Stewart. John Stewart. John Stewart. The Italian uh, I version of John Stewart just did a column for one of the leading papers in Italy, a kind of comedy column, which was composed of 10 tips for etiquette, what to do when the Pope calls you up. <laughs> okay. The last one of which was my favorite, actually. Item 10 was, uh, if the Pope is going on a little bit long, don't be the one to get off the phone. Let him finish. Okay, And then if your family is bitching at you about how long you've been on the phone, when you're done, hang up and then say to them, oh, by the way, the, um, the vicar of Christ and the successor of St. Peter says hello. So what's for dinner? <laughs> anyway, uh, so this, well, this Palumbo guy is one of the guys that Pope Francis called up. Now, Palumbo, as I say, is very well known in traditionalist circles in Italy. And in September... It's Pope Francis. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Hey, he was calling you. Yeah. He just it. And what does it say that he thought he could reach me through you? That's what we really, <laughs> that's what we need to pursue. Anyway, uh, this Palumbo guy was famous because in September he wrote a piece for one of the leading Italian papers called Il Folio, the headline of which was Perché questo Papa non ci piace, which means why we don't like this Pope. Okay? So flash forward to December. Palumbo is now in the hospital. He's got some kind of respiratory disease. Francis calls him up and says to him, listen, I, I understand you're in the hospital. I just wanted you to know that I'm praying for you. I'm going to remember you in my mass tomorrow. Uh, and Palumbo says, well, Holy Father, that, that means the world to me. And it's, it's especially moving because of what I wrote about you in September. And Francis didn't even let him finish the sentence. He cut him off and said, no, 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 listen. I know you wrote that out of love, and these are things I need to hear. Okay. So listen, I mean, Francis is going to try to bring these people along. But I want to end with this thought. I think there's something all of us can do to help the Pope in this enterprise, that is, of trying to bring people along. Let me start with an empirical observation. I don't know whether you are on the most enthusiastic end of the spectrum about Pope Francis or the most ambivalent. We probably have some in this room who were from each end and, and points in between. But what is empirically undeniable is the following. The highest priority of the Catholic Church right now, dating from John Paul II, confirmed by Benedict XVI, and reconfirmed by Pope Francis, the highest priority of the Catholic Church is supposed to be the new evangelization. That is the effort to reintroduce the Christian faith and the Catholic Church to a secular world that is often jaded, often skeptical, and sometimes hostile. Okay, that's supposed to be what we're about right now. Now, I would submit to you that we are unlikely to get a greater missionary calling card in our lifetimes than Pope Francis. I mean, the point of it, wh whether you are enthusiastic or ambivalent, the point of it is, the eyeballs of the world are on this man, and therefore the eyeballs of the world are upon us. And the key question becomes, when they're looking at us, what are they going to see? And it seems to me there are two plausible trajectories there. Okay. One 
ah is that they're going to see a debating society. that is, they're going to see a community of people who were at one another's throats, arguing over the precise theological valence of every last participle that flows out of the pope's mouth. in other words, they're going to see a community that is sucking the new energy created by pope francis into the same sausage grinder of ideological and tribal rivalries that we seem to suck everything else into. i mean, you all there's an old joke, and you all probably have heard. it goes like this there's a dad who's sitting in his living room and he hears a commotion upstairs so he goes upstairs and he sees all the kids sitting on folding chairs in a circle uh, in one of the bedrooms and they're screaming their lungs out at each other. Okay? one of them is saying, you're a complete idiot and the other is saying, no, you're totally wrong and i can prove it. and so the dad says, what in the world is going on here? and one of the kids looks up and says, oh don't worry dad, we're just playing church. Stings a little bit, doesn't it? But but there's a little bit of truth there. I mean, you know, I suppose because religion is about the de deepest passions of the human soul. I mean, it it often lends itself to a kind of climate of animosity and demonization, uh, and we've certainly experienced plenty of that in Catholic life. So one plausible trajectory for the new missionary momentum being created by Pope Francis is that it could become derailed uh, into those tribal animosities and end up being squandered. Now, the other plausible trajectory uh, is that when the world looks at us, they could see a community of people genuinely striving to realize the vision for Catholic life laid out by this pope. That is, a community of people genuinely striving to become, in that iconic image of Pope Francis, the field hospital of humanity. The field hospital in which the wounds of the world are cured. They could see a community of people who were genuinely trying to get out of the sacristy and into the streets to embrace the broken, bruised, hurting, and forgotten of the world and to make the message of Jesus Christ come alive uh, in the postmodern milieu of the 21st century. Now, this choice is completely up to you, but I would suggest to you that that second option is by far the more attractive missionary alternative. So, can I give you, can I finish by just giving a bit of uh, totally unsolicited, blunt advice to the people in this room? Let me start with those of you who are most enthusiastic about Pope Francis, most pumped up about what you're seeing. Okay? And let me invite you to a particular piece of Lytton discipline. Here it is. Stop using Pope Francis as a club to beat up on other people in the church you don't like. Okay? That is, if you have a bishop that you think is a troglodyte, if you have a pastor you think is a clericalist jerk, whatever, resist the temptation to run up to these people and wave a picture of the Pope in their face and scream, why can't you be more like him? Okay, I guarantee you it is counterproductive, it's not going to help, it's going to turn the Pope into a point of division rather than a point of unity. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Lent. Okay. Now, let me address those of you who are the most ambivalent end of the spectrum, who are most concerned about where things are going, who are worried that perhaps we're tossing the baby out with the bathwater and so on. Here's the Lenten discipline to which I would like to invite you, and I know, I know, this is very counterintuitive for the America of the early 21st century, but I guarantee you it is true. You do not have to have an opinion on something five seconds after it happens. Okay? Sit with what you're, say, what you're seeing and what you're hearing for a little bit. Meditate on it. Pray over it. To use the language about the Blessed Virgin in the Gospels. Okay? Ponder these things in your heart. Okay, because I guarantee you, if you do that, you are going to be surprised and consoled about where all of this ends up. So when you see something from the Pope you don't understand, or what is the more likely scenario? When you see somebody whose opinions you don't share celebrating this Pope, really grooving on what Francis is about, resist the temptation to run immediately to your iBook or whatever it is you have and post an angry screed in the blogosphere. Okay, once again, I guarantee you, it is not going to help. It's counterproductive. It's going to turn the Pope into a point of division rather than a point of unity. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Lent. Okay. 
Final point to you is this. If we genuinely can come together as a community of believers with all of our massive differences, but if we can pull together towards that vision of the Catholic Church as the field hospital in which the wounds of humanity are, are cured, and if we can avoid the dead-end street of sterile, ideological, political, and theological combat on the back of the energy being created by this pope, if we can do those things, then ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you that as a winning strategy for the new evangelization every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Okay. Thank you, God bless you, God bless Loyola University. Viva il Papa!